Today, ha I have an honor to introduce Hilda Kwan. Okay. She is currently a, a hydrologist at the Mendocino National Forest Upper Lake and uh, Covelo Rancho District. Before being stationed at the Upper Lake region, she was a hydrologist at the California's Sequoia National Forest, where she examined and documented waterway erosion, stream, and uh, riparian uh, restoration projects, management, and efforts of uh, post-wildfire conditions. She received her master's in hydrology at the University of Nevada, Reno, and her bachelor's in forestry at the uh, Humboldt State University. In 2014, the Journal of American Water Resource Association published Kwan's co-authored paper, uh, Predictions on Stream Bank Erosion for Sequoia National Forest. In addition to Forest Service, Kwan is an active member of Asian Pacific American Heritage Collaborative, part of the APAEA, where she helps build a, a collaborative partnership among forest services, APA communities, nonprofit universities, and other agencies to provide in interpretation and access to heritage resources on public land for APA urban communities and others. Her, ongo her, her ongoing work uh, particularly in post-wildfire hydrology conditions, provides fascinating insight on the lasting impact that wildfire leaves behind long after they disappear. So please welcome Hilda Kwan, and now stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello, and thank you so much for being here, especially on a Friday afternoon. Um, it's great to see so many of you here. Uh, some of you may be wondering, why are we doing a session on wildland fire and hydrology? Um, my hopes at the end of this discussion is for you to understand a little bit about the processes that happen post-fire, and this being an architectural program, um, provide a little bit of food for thought as you move through your program and careers. Um, let me try to share a screen here. Hopefully it all works out. Okay, are you guys seeing a PowerPoint? Give me a thumbs up, yeah, okay, awesome. Um, so again, my name is Hilda Kwan and thank you Professor Abe um, for that very nice introduction. Um, I just wanted to add a little bit of, of a personal note about my experience with wildfire response. Um, when I became a permanent employee for the Forest Service uh, about 10 years ago, I would say about 98% of my work was not fire related, um, which would make sense, right? Because I'm a hydrologist. Um, the very first fire that I worked on in 2010 was about 20,000 acres. Um, and that time it was considered a moderate to large size fire. Uh, the next one was 90,000 acres. Um, and that was really considered huge at the time. I think that was 2012. Um, and so throughout the years, the duration and size and complexity of the fires just continue to grow as, as you all have um, heard and learned about throughout this, uh, throughout this lecture series. Um, in 2020, last year, I calculated about 25% of my time was actually spent on active fire incidents. Um, including the fire that topped over a million acres, which, you know, that's kind of a new record that unfortunately we've set for ourselves. Um, and if you remember, I'm not a direct fire personnel, I'm a hydrologist. So um, that 25% is actually quite large in terms of uh, time that, that, you know, it's, it's time that I normally would have been working on other things uh, such as fuels reduction and forest thinning to prevent wild, wildfires um, instead uh, of working on actual fires. Let's see here. Are you guys still seeing my PowerPoint? Yeah, okay. I see it in full screen now. Okay, all right. Let's see here, okay. Um, 
So in the chat, I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'll see if I can pull it up in the chat. I'd like for you to type out a word or two that comes to mind when you hear the, the, word, the terms wildland fire. Um, I know you probably have a pretty robust vocabulary now um, that you've sat through several of these uh, lectures regarding and probably all things related to fires. Um, these terms might be related to prediction tools, climate change, uh, different management of fires and so forth. Um, and so let me see if I can pull that up. I don't know if I'm savvy enough. New levels of intensity and speed. Yeah, um, yes, unpredictability. That's a good one. Louis, that's a that's another that's another like hot keyword, right? Okay. Um, and you've likely heard that the concept of wildland fires. Um, you know, are actually a natural disturbance. Now, other natural disturbances may include things like earthquakes, floods, monsoons, hurricanes, volcano eruptions, um, even locust infestations are considered a natural disturbance. Um, but these events, you know, they're all natural until we, you know, we, we call them disasters when it impacts human life, property, or livelihood. Um, and in bringing this back to our subject of wildland fire, um, it is when fires happen in this buoy zone or the wildland urban interface um, that we get disasters or um, there is a potential for disasters because of buoys. So today I'm going to take you through a different perspective of wildland fire. We're going to look at what happens after the smoke is cleared. Um, for a lot of people and news outlets, um, they've already moved on to the next big story or event. Um, however, for myself and my colleagues, um, this is when we gear up and we head out in the burned area. Um, and we're looking for the secondary emergency that hasn't quite emerged yet. Um, and what I'm specifically talking about uh, are floods and debris flows um, and just, I just put these two photos up in the um, in the slide. The figure on the left shows the path of a fire tornado that happened this year on the bootleg fire in Southern Oregon. Um, you might have seen videos of you know these new fire tornadoes that are popping up. I think car, the Car Fire um, up in Redding was one of the first ones that uh, emerged. But this is what it looks like um, from an aerial perspective. You can see the the tornado kind of took a spin around um, a group of trees there. And then the figure on the right um, is a picture of the Eel River in Northern California after the 2018 ranch fire. So when fire burns and kills off vegetation, oftentimes also burning up roots associated with these plants, um, we're left with a landscape that is denuded or lacking in live vegetation. Um, in the slide, these, these are pictures of the same place taken before and after a fire um, in a stream where I've been monitoring for the past few years. Um, what I wanna point out is the vast contrast between the picture on the left, um, which was taken from the summer of 2019. Um, and then we had a fire in 2020, the big August complex million acre plus fire. Um, and the picture in the middle on the right um, was taken earlier this year. Uh, none of the trees in the area survived. And this summer we saw some plants coming back, um, but it's, it wasn't very much and it was very slow. It may be hard to imagine that something as simple as plants and roots being able to hold an entire hillside intact. Um, but that is how awesome plants are. Uh, without it, you basically get erosion um, this is one of the reasons why the loss of plants and trees is such a big deal after a fire. Um, another phenomenon I want to quickly mention is that oftentimes in these large landscape fires, we will see areas that quote unquote reburn um, or continue to smolder a year later. Uh, the reason for this is because the fire will actually get into the tree's root system 
um, and it'll burn or smolder slowly underground. Um, it'll sit through, it'll sit, it'll burn underground through the winter time, even if there's snow um, on top of the ground there. Um, and then, you know, when it heats up again, the following summer, uh, these stump holes, you'll, sometimes you'll see smoke coming out. Um, and so that's what I've, I'm trying to like show, illustrate on the picture on the right here with the, the burned out stump hole and, and the roots um, that were burned out. Um, while the area is already burned, um, it is still considered a watch, a watch out situation for firefighters, um, especially if we get extreme shifts in weather and wind. Okay, so I'm going to rewind a little bit more and try to try to explain how this process uh, relates to hydrology. So you got to bear with me as I geek out a little bit over hydrology. Um, so here we have a somewhat simple diagram of the hydrologic cycle. Um, you might remember this from like fifth grade or middle school. That's usually when um, kids and children learn about the hydrologic cycle. We're gonna start on the left-hand side um, and you see the, the bright sun, it heats up the earth um, and we get evaporation, water vapor, water vapor goes up into to the atmosphere. Um, and once we get enough of this water vapor, condensation forms, and eventually we get precipitation, such as rain or snow. Um, and once we get this rain, it'll hit the ground and some of the water is absorbed into the ground. Um, and that's what we call infiltration. Some of the water is absorbed by plants and the remaining water that's not soaked in the ground or taken up by plants, uh, it just flows downhill. So we call that overland flow. And this water will flow into streams um, all the way into larger bodies like lakes or oceans. And then the cycle continues. Um, however, when we have a wildfire, this hydrologic process gets interrupted in several different ways. Um, dead plants and trees no longer require water. Um, you lose most, if not all, of that microclimate phenomenon where you know places that are, are moist because of the, the trees keep that moisture in that microclimate. Um, so you lose that and you have a landscape that's basically dry. And another um, disruption that fires cause is primarily uh, due to, for, uh, in regards to soils. Um, soils have this chemical property that when it's heated, it often creates this like thin fi film that prevents water from soaking in. So if you remember that hydrologic cycle, um, I talked about the infiltration process where water soaks into the ground. Well, what you see here is water is sitting on the soils, not soaking in. Um, so that's, and that's what we call hydrophobicity. So next time someone asks you about words and, and uh, well and fire, you can throw out hydrophobicity as a, as a fancy schmancy word. Um, what I'm trying to allude to is the disruption of infiltration um, is due to hydrophobicity. Um, so that leads to more overland flow. And with that, um, there is an increased chance for flooding to happen. And another potential danger is this added stuff that comes with the flooding. So uh, loose rocks, dirt, woody material, um, those are all susceptible to getting washed away simply because we don't have live vegetation holding things together anymore. So just an overview of what I kind of just talked about. Um, this slide shows an overview of that process. Um, before the fire and rain, you have your happy hill slope and equilibrium. This is the, the figure on the left. Um, plants are alive and holding soils and sediment together. Um, and then you have fire come through um, during the summer and your, your plants and trees are essentially dead and this is this causes for sediment to loosen up and then the figure on the right hand side um, you add rain to this landscape your hydrologic processes have been disrupted um, you get a lot of more overland flow and ultimately you get sediment and more water flowing downslope into the watershed um, 
just a really quick check before I move on. Does this, does anyone have any questions on this process or does it make sense? Did it track? Let's see if I can pull this screen back up. Maybe Carlo, you might have to help me look because I only see you and like two other people. Hey, Hilda, um, I was just wondering about the hydrophobicity of the soil. Is there a way or how is there, is that process counteracted in a natural way or is there a way to go out and sort of help um, combat that? That's a really good question. So hydrophobicity is, um, depending on the soil type, it is a natural phenomenon. Like you'll get it even without a fire. Um, the thing about fire is it, it makes it worse. So um, if I go try to go back. Um, so the water won't sit there forever. Typically, I, I think the longest um, a soil scientist told me is just over five minutes, the water will sit there and it will eventually penetrate into the ground. Um, and there's no easy, I mean, there are applications we can probably do to make the water soak into the ground. But if you're, you're talking about like thousands and thousands of acres, that's just not feasible. Um, so hopefully that kind of answers your question, Gibson. Yeah, definitely, thanks. If I, if I can may ask a question before we move on. Uh, in general, what are the, the depths of, um, of earth and material that that uh, like slide down, you know, is there, I don't know, what is the range of depth of the amount of surface? Yeah, so for somewhere that somewhere that's already stable, um, that has no um, instability, usually it can be several inches. Um, but if you have an area like um, that's really prone to like landslides that are, you know, that that sit on like you know, near a fault line or something like that, that just has instability naturally, um, like the whole hillside can come down. And we'll see, and we'll see some examples of that um, as we move through. All right, anything else before I move on? Okay, I can't see the chat, so. Um, if there's nothing else, I will keep going. All right, uh, so I'm gonna show a couple uh, quick videos. Let me try to, oops. Okay, let's see if this will work. All right, so the first one here is a video from way back 2003. And let's hope it plays. The debris flow in the Bori. Took my poor mailbox down. Look at it. Boulders, biggest. So this was um, in San Bernardino County. It was a um, couple months after a fire ran through that area, and the guys talking about his mailbox being washed away. Um, so this is just a First video. Um, let's see, next one. This one is from the Holy Fire. We got debris flow coming right now. Debris flow coming down here. That. Canyon Road. Slug of water and debris coming down. This is in Tribuco Canyon in uh, Orange County. If any, any of you are from that block. area. And this happened um, in 2018, uh, right after, shortly after the Holy Fire um, on the Cleveland National Forest. So it's, this is a good one just because you can see the slug of stuff coming down the hill. And then this last video, uh, and there's no, there's no sound, this is just a drone video 
uh, drone footage. Um, this is Glenwood Canyon in Colorado earlier this summer in 2021. Uh, the debris flow took out part of a major interstate, I-70, um, and a fire had burned through this area the year before. Um, and the drone is going to follow the path of the debris flow. And I might speed it up a little bit so we get into the, the burn area, but hopefully Carl, this kind of uh, answers your earlier question of how much stuff can come out. It, it's a lot of stuff that can come off the hill slope. Um, uh, the highway had to be closed down for several weeks. Um, and the cost to fix and clean this up was in the tens of millions of dollars. Um, uh, over a hundred people had to get rescued because they were trapped in between debris slides on the um, on that interstate. So let me just forward, fast forward a little bit. Um, it's making it it's way up way up into the canyon, and you can see a lot of the trees are burnt. And so like wildland fires, you know, floods are a natural disturbance and it is a natural phenomenon, um, but they become disasters when um, humans are involved. Um, so hopefully I will illustrate that a little more clearer. I'm gonna, hopefully you guys get the picture here that, um, you know, all of this originated from a burned area. So I'm gonna go through a couple, I would kind of consider them case studies or examples. Um, go back one. Okay. So the Heyman fire happened just Northwest of Colorado Springs, Colorado in 2002. Um, at the time, this fire was the largest in Colorado's his recorded history. Um, 138,000 acres. Um, and this fire burned around this place called the Cheeseman Reservoir, um, which was a major, which is a major water supply in Denver. Um, because of the post fire effects that included sedimentation, the city of Denver had to spend more than $27 million in dealing with treating water that they otherwise would not have had to. Um, and then on the after the tubs and the campfire here in California, researchers examined the tap water of nearby homes um, and found benzene and other carcinogenic compounds. Um, these chemicals were probably leached into the water supply uh, from burned plastic pipes, melted metals, and just burned debris from all the homes and, and just infrastructure that was burned during those fires. Roads is another value that are often affected by post-fire processes. Um, we saw in the last video um, of Glenwood Canyon in Colorado, um, a major interstate like that not only disrupts people traveling, but also has economic implications as well. Um, you know, when trucks carrying goods have to take a detour or if they're just, you know, um, delayed by quite a bit of time. Um, the image on the top left is from Highway 70 in Northern California um, from just this past week's atmospheric river. Um, and this was within the footprint of the Dixie fire. Um, for a lot of people that live in mountains or rural areas, there may only be one road going in and, in and out to your home. So, you know, if a road gets washed out and you have an emergency, you know, what are you gonna do? Um, what kind of backup plan might you have? Um, on the same note, a lot of our communication towers are located on top of mountains. Um, if something happens to those comm towers and they need to be repaired or maintained, um, that access can be the key to whether, you know, people have communications to the outside world or not. Um, and this is especially important in mountainous and rural communities as well. <clears throat> Um, last year was an unprecedented year for Southern California, especially for the Angeles National Forest. 
Um, if you were around last summer, you probably remembered there were so many smoky days um, in, in LA. Um, and this likely came from either the Bobcat or the Lake Fire. Um, one of the areas that burned in the Bobcat Fire was the big Santa Anita Canyon, just outside of Monrovia. Um, and the photo on the right here um, is an overview of that canyon. And while it still looks pretty green in the actual canyon itself, the mountains surrounding them um, were burned pretty hot at a pretty severe um, uh, burn severity. Um, what you can't see in that photo are the series of primitive cabins that lie under that canopy. Uh, over a hundred of these cabins were built in the early 1900s for recreation purposes. Um, definitely in an area era where climate the climate was different um, from what it is today. The left two photos uh, hopefully illustrate just how close some of these cabins um, are to the stream channel. And uh, like the one on the, the, in the middle, the retaining wall had to be built um, to pre protect the cabins um, just from normal flows. Come on. All right. Um, so there's a few things going on in this slide. Um, on the left, you'll, you'll see a cabin with large boulders surrounding it. These boulders came from past and historic debris flows. Um, the photo on the right is a picture of something called a check dam. Um, and throughout this canyon, there's these series of check dams um, that were put in by LA Department of Water and Power and the Forest Service. Uh, in the 1950s and 60s to capture any large amount of sediment and debris coming down the canyon, essentially to protect um, uh, these cabins. Um, so after the Bobcat fire, we spent a considerable amount of time looking um, in this canyon and trying to determine whether there is a potential for these cabins to be affected by the increase um, of runoff and sediment. Another similar situation happened uh, during the Ranch 2 fire last year, uh, not too far away from Big Santa Anita Canyon. Um, here we have Roberts Canyon um, and about 90% of the watershed, uh, except for that little green patch surrounded by red fire retardant um, burned. And you can see that at the bottom of this burned canyon is a subdivision. Um, so hopefully you can kind of start putting those, those, those dots, connecting those dots together on what kind of concern we might have here. In this slide, the figure on the left, uh, it, that's just another shot of this Roberts Canyon subdivision. Um, and if you're thinking that that geography looks similar to the other two photos on the right, you're absolutely correct. Um, many of these subdivisions that back into these mountains, um, especially in Southern California, are built on what we call alluvial fans. Um, these are basically sediment deposits um, from a steep narrow canyon uh, th that gets deposited into this flat open area. Um, these places at face value seem like an obvious place to build homes and a community because it's, it's flat, um, but as, these developments get built without consideration for climate change, geomorphology, and fire danger, you can um, end up with disasters for a lack of better word. This is another visual uh, of human habitation downstream of a burned area. The town of Markleyville um, is in the center of this photo. It's just directly downstream of um, the Tamarack fire that happened earlier this year. And so here we have a few examples of the destruction that some of these debris flows can have. Um, the one on the left is from Camarillo Springs in Ventura County in 2014. Um, and the photo on the right is from the 2018 Mont Montecito debris event from the Thomas fire. Um, some of you might remember this. It happened right around New Year's. Um, the fire itself happened in December and large portions of the Montecito community were evacuated. 
And by the time people were allowed back into their homes, um, many people ignored evacuation warnings from the flood because they were evacuated already. And it was like the holidays and um, people just, they were tired from, you know, they didn't want to go anywhere. Um, and unfortunately, 23 people were killed during this event. So on that somewhat somber note, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I do as well as uh, many of my colleagues. Within the US Forest Service, we have a pro program called the Burn Area Emergency Response, um, where we come in and we assess post-fire risk. Um, and the way we do this is largely dependent on something we call the soil burn severity mapping. Um, and I'm gonna play a video that gives a good overview of the BEAR program. Wildfires threaten, we value lives and property, wildlife, recreational facilities, and watersheds, just to name a few. As large fires die down, burned area emergency response or BEAR teams are dispatched. They assess the immediate risks to the public and the post-fire threats to forest roads, trails, and other infrastructure on U.S. Forest Service lands. The immediate threats that we're really focusing on in Bear are the flooding threats, the debris flow threats, the potential of danger trees coming down across roads and into our recreation sites. Satellite images are used to make an estimate of the fire damage done to the soil because in our forests, the health and condition of the soil has an impact on everything else. The reason that we really focus on the soil burn severity in the burn dairy emergency response process is because that is what's gonna drive our post-fire flooding and debris flows. We're gonna see those high responses with more water coming down the streams, more erosion coming off the slope. We're trying to treat for emergencies within the first year post-fire and preferably before the first damaging storms come in. If there's nothing holding back the sediment and erosion does occur, all this can um, destroy roads that a lot of our citizens use. It can deposit sediments into fish bearing streams. And most of all, it's human safety. If we don't have anything to hold back the soil, it will fall eventually. The field observations, along with aerial reconnaissance, are used to produce a soil burn severity map. The map has a scale that goes from unburned through low and moderate up to high soil burn severity. And we'll start focusing our treatments and our assessments on areas that have high and moderate soil burn severity. Those are the areas that are gonna have the highest hydrologic response post fire, the highest areas of denuded ground and more areas for invasive weeds to establish. We look at the probability of where those things could occur. And then based on the magnitude of consequences and the probability of that event, we come up with a risk. And if the risk warrants, we may treat for that hazard. Might have to raise it, huh? As the field assessments are completed, the Bear team will recommend immediate actions, which they call treatments. These are designed to keep us all safe while we're in the forest and also to protect the investments we've already made in our roads, campgrounds, wildlife habitat, and trails. For example, this uh, burned out retaining wall that you see behind me, about 350 feet of retaining wall, if this retaining wall is not either replaced or the soil is otherwise somehow retained, it'll end up in this creek right here, we'll lose this trail, and it'll cost a heck of a lot more money to replace the entire trail. If we determine that those risks that we're seeing out there are unacceptable, then we try to figure out what is the minimum mitigation that we can do? What's the minimum solution that we can provide to bring that risk from that unacceptable level to an acceptable level? I'd say there's a, there's a constant uh, balancing act between public access and safety. We strive uh, as a service to maintain that delicate balance and we strive to open up all areas of the forest back to the public uh, as soon as it is safe to do so. Okay, so in summary, BEAR is an emergency program to identify imminent post-fire wildfire threats to the following critical values, human life and safety, 
property, natural resources, and cultural resources. Um, and within our jurisdiction, we will take immediate actions to manage any unacceptable risk. So, oops, okay. So why is BEAR necessary? So one of the major reasons we have this program um, is to minimize threats to human life and safety. Um, hopefully I've illustrated enough through my previous slides um, of the threat of floods and debris to humans and, and property. Um, in addition to life safety property, um, we also look at other values um, because the Forest Service is, is you know, we were a multi-use agency. So um, we're looking at other things like threatened and endangered animals and plants, including their habitat. Uh, water quality is a big thing we look at. Soil productivity, because that's what, you know, plants require productive soils to grow. Um, and potential for invasive weeds, and as well as, well as cultural resources. So here we have um, critical habitat for steelhead in Eastern Oregon. Um, this was it, from the Canyon Creek fire in 2015 that I worked on, um, on the along the John Day River. Uh, we were, you know, we were worried about habitat for steelhead, which is listed as threatened. Um, and on the right is the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir um, after the Rim Fire of 2013. Uh, land managers were concerned for this area because this reservoir supplies most of the water consumed by the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, luckily, they did not see much impact like the Cheeseman Reservoir um, that we went over earlier. Um, but it was something that um, had to be identified and it went through the assessment process um, to figure out whether it will be impacted or not. So how do we do our analysis? The video kind of talked about it a little bit. I'm just gonna go give a couple more details on that. Um, so we talked about the soil burn severity map um, you've probably seen other similar maps um, from previous uh, lectures with this like yellow, red, yellow, green, high, moderate, low uh, scheme or classification. Uh, likely those maps were describing vegetation mortality. So, um, so red would mean like there's a high probability for those trees and vegetation to be dead versus the green would mean that those plants are likely to survive. Um, however, here, what we're looking, about, looking at is um, the soils specifically. Um, and this map is derived from something we call the burn area reflecting classification or the bark map. Um, and this is created by our Geospatial Technology Application Center. Um, what they do is they take satellite passovers of the fi fire area. And depending on the reflectance from the ground, they can estimate um, soil burn severity. Uh, so when soils burn really, really hot, you get a lot of ash, which is white. And so that reflects pretty intensely back into, um, I, I guess, the sensors of, of these satellites. Um, An unburned area will have less of, of this reflectance because it's green and it's, it's dark. Um, so what we do is we take this bark map and we ground truth it because um, we want to make sure that we have uh, you know, it, it's verified on the ground. Um, and, and, and then it becomes what we use uh, to base a lot of our analysis on. Um, from a hydrologic perspective, areas that have a higher soil burn severity, which, which is like the red is, is what I'm talking about, um, will generally be at more risk of erosion. Um, Hydrophobicity might be a little more extreme in those areas. and um, as well as um, you know, the likelihood of that vegetation being dead is a lot higher. Um, those two, they, for the most part, they go hand in hand, but not always. Um, so while we're out in the field, um, we also try to identify those values at risk. Um, so remember those, those might be human life safety, property, natural resources, and cultural resources. So if we identify imminent threats, what can we do? 
Um, while we, the Forest Service, are limited to the jurisdiction um, of the lands that we manage, we often will work with state, local, private, and other federal entities um, to try and address these downstream values. Um, so if you remember some of the examples um, that I talked about, such as Roberts Canyon and um, that Montecito area, those are all areas outside of the Forest Service jurisdiction, but the burn area um, was on Forest Service. So what we do is we work with those partners to let them know and say, hey, you, you know, have a burn area above, you may experience flooding and debris um, if, if an intense uh, rainstorm or precipitation event um, is predicted. Um, so that, and we'll share our findings and recommendations with them. Um, but so what can we do on Forest Service lands? I'm just, I just wanna give a quick overview of that. We have what we call land treatments that include uh, mulch, straw, and hay applications. And this essentially provides immediate ground cover to lessen the impacts of rain um, to help prevent erosion. Um, and in the right situation, aerial seed application uh, may be effective as well, um, but these are extremely expensive options um, due to the need for aircraft use. So um, we often will do um, kind of like a cost benefit ratio. Is it, is it worth um, the money to do this? We always want to apply the treatments that are the most effective and most cost effective as well. So sometimes that means closing, completely closing off a road um, for the public. And if closing a road is not feasible um, due to whatever reason, um, there are some things that we can do to prevent the road from washing out. Um, these may include things you see on the screen. Um, culvert upgrades are seldom done because of the cost and it usually just takes a lot of time um, to do. There are some monitoring that we will allow under the BEAR program. Um, this includes storm patrol, meaning having people go out during or immediately after a storm um, to report back any road failures um, and then try to come up with a solution on how to fix it. Um, we also have botanists that will go out um, to the burn area the following year to monitor the spread of invasive plants. And on rare occasions, um, we do we will do in-stream treatments um, that can be recommended. Usually this is for aquatic species that are listed under the Endangered Species Act. So if you remember, um, I had a slide with the with a canyon with this with like steelhead habitat below um, for the John Day River. Um, the photo, the the top, the photo on the top right and the left, the, those were treatments that we ended up putting in. Um, this generally creates a, like a log jam or a debris catchment um, to try and protect some of the habitat um, of the steelhead. Okay, so bringing this all together, um, I want to revisit the Roberts Canyon area just because it's a really great example. Um, while we were doing our assessment, um, safety to the people in the community were the in initial and the greatest concern that we have. Um, fortunately, while doing this research and ground truthing, um, we found that the developers actually put some forethought uh, into these potential threats. Um, when we visited the site, it, it appeared that the stream channel was largely untouched um, and likely had the capacity to accommodate any flood and debris flow. So that's on the, on the left photo, um, you'll see there's a channel, there's a stream channel that winds kind of through the center of the picture there. Um, oftentimes in urbanized areas, you will see streams and rivers um, channelized. And what I, we mean by that is, all the vegetation gets removed and it's either paved and it's paved over with concrete um, to accommodate for urban development. But this was not done here. And I think that's, that was really good of them to do that. Um, and then the photo on the right, you'll see next to that big white large, that's a water tank. You see these two like U-shaped looking things. Um, 
And what they are, they are sediment debris catchment basins. Um, these are specifically designed to catch any debris and large amounts of water coming off the hillside. Um, the water will flow through that standpipe um, and the water will get diverted away from the homes um, while the, any debris that's captured um, will remain in that little concrete basin looking thing. Um, one thing to note is that these things do need to be cleaned out once they, you know, once they accumulate stuff. Um, and for this specific location, it, it is um, the homeowners association that is in charge of doing that. Um, there are similar structures all along the base of the San Gabriel Mountains. So um, like Azusa, Monrovia, Glendale, those towns that back, the, those neighborhoods that back up into the San Gabriel, they, they have very similar um, structures that are maintained by Los Angeles Department of Department of Water and Power. Um, so with that, it's, I mean, it's important to plan development projects accordingly and make sure you try to account for any natural hazards that may not be obvious um, and to put into place any kind of mitigation measures um, to pre protect people and to prevent disasters. Um, all right, with that, I feel like I've talked a really, really long time. So thank you for your time. Um, and if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. Um, I've tried to take a complex process and explain it in a way that, you know, hopefully that it is um, easily understandable. And um, I would welcome any feedback um, that you all have. Thanks again. Thank you. Actually, I have a, a, a favor to ask you, student. Can you turn on your camera if it's possible to show the appreciation to the speaker? And also uh, maybe we can actually uh, ask questions. I do appreciate that if you turn on your camera. The first question I want to ask is, is that you on this PowerPoint that is me. wearing red helmet? Wow. Yeah, that is me. It's, uh, you know, it's, Last year worked out really well because you know we had to like mask up and so weren't you know we weren't inhaling all that ash and dust so <laughs> it, it worked out really good. That was on the bobcat fire. I see, I see. Wow. I guess uh, now uh, we'd like to open up to the questions and anybody who wants to ask question, please jump in. I have a couple, but uh, I will wait. Um, well, I'll, I'll jump in, Hitoshi. Uh, Thank you. While uh, well, probably other people are formulating their questions. Thank, thank you so much, Hilda. Wow, it's super fascinating. And you know, um, uh, this is uh, as Hitoshi probably mentioned. This is the second year we've been looking at um, fire responses, and um, every time we have a landscape architect on a review. Um, the, you know, within the first uh, 15 minutes of the discussion, they'll, they'll say, to be sure, they'll say, well, have you guys looked at the hydrology? Um, and so uh, it's so great to have you um, present this information so that we can understand the impact um, post fire and um, just how extensive after a fire the hydrology implications are. Um, I, I, this is kind of a, a more of a communications question. Um, I mean, this is such important information. What, what are the ways that the information is, is um, disseminated to the general public? And what are the, the challenges of disseminating information to the general public so they understand um, just how important this, this cycle is to the ecosystems in which we live. Um, I mean, and I, I guess I ask that because in general, the fire prevention um, communication is limited. Uh, you know, like it just doesn't occupy a lot of our, our attention over the course of the day. And, you know, as you mentioned that if it does, it's during the fire itself, it's, it's not really after a fire. 
So I, I uh, so yeah, what are the challenges? What are the ways in which um, info is distributed? Yeah, no, thank you. That was, that's a really good question. And um, I will say we definitely struggle with that. Um, I think like in the case of the Montecito debris flow event, that's a really good example because people were evacuated. It was December, it was late December, people were evacuated and they were away from their homes and then they were let back in. And, you know, I think it was like a week or two later, you know, um, uh, the weather service, NOAA, they said, you know, there's a huge storm coming, you may want to consider evacuating. And so it, it, there's, a, there's, there's this whole like human aspect to it where like people want to stay put, right? Um, and and I, I think, I, I do feel like, you know, in the course of like the 10 years that I've been doing this, um, there has been more media attention to this post-fire um, process. Uh, but I think it's more it's more localized. Um, so it's you know with like Roberts Canyon, we were specifically talking with that HOA um, and letting them know, hey, this is what will happen, and you know hopefully you know they're you know I, I know they had people that were communicating with you know their residents, um, but you know with this last atmospheric river, I felt like I saw a lot more news. Um, stories on, you know, just like a watch out situation type of thing. Um, and uh, the USGS, the Geological Survey, they have in the past um, set up uh, trigger like monitoring systems. And so like upstream, they'll put in um, like a, like a, just like a trigger, like something to like warn people. So if like the water gets so high, it'll trigger like a um, uh, like a message that gets sent to the people downstream to say, hey, you may want to consider evacuating. Um, so those things do get put into place. Um, but in terms of like the broader public, um, you know, I think that's just a matter of more like more efforts and time um, to be able to get more people aware of this, this issue because you know, I just feel like the news channels, like they love ch chasing, you know, the, the biggest, you know, the, the thing that's going to draw people, right? And this will draw people, but it's usually after the fact. Um, so I think, I think we're making slow progress with that. Right. I think, Thank you. Thanks so much. I think maybe my question um, relates a bit to that, but your last example about the developer's consideration and accommodation of, um, the stream channel makes me wonder about if there are resources specifically for developers in this area to access that could help them um, be more strategic about how they plan. And if there's, if, if yeah, if there's specific like communication channels between the experts and the developers. Yeah, that's a really good question. Sounds like something you want to research, Gibson. Um, <laughs> I, unfortunately, I, I, I personally don't know. Um, but I, I, I would think there are those kinds of resources out there. Um, the geological survey puts out information on post-fire flooding. FEMA is a really good resource because they, they do the flood map, the, the floodplain mapping. Um, so for like developers, they can see, um, you know, on a map, like where those flood zones are. Um, so that those are just kind of the two resources I can think off the top of my head. Um, I, I'm sure LADWP has um, similar resources as well, um, but that that's a really good that's a really good question, and, and I'm glad you're thinking of that. Thanks. There's always usual suspect as asking questions so uh Carlo, i mean the, actually uh he'll he'll like, can you go back to that picture of the some kind of a uh the flood showing this kind of land pattern and then compare with that sort of area of development and kind of show you know there's a not this one i think the one be way before 
Like you oh, were showing this one? how the no before that. This one. Yeah, yeah, this one. Uh how how do oh, oh. so this land and then you kind of showed me that development which is actually sitting on top of something similar to this one. Am I right? Yeah, so so that development is sitting on top of an alluvial fan. Alluvial fan. Is this yeah. a common common kind of a thing happening in that? Because yeah, if there's a mountain area and if this happens and that fills in and creates a flat land naturally, so developer goes there and develop it. It's very common. Uh, yeah, it looks just shocking. Yeah, Actually, if you compare this way, and if you, I think it, a really good, um, I so I pull. If you look on Google Earth, you'll see a lot of that. It's Google Earth is is really good at um, seeing these type of things. So in a way, alluvial fan. Sorry, finally I could pronounce it. <laughs> alluvial fan is triggering the development, but the alveol fan is a result of the basically the fire or the landslide. That's it's, yeah, it's not necessarily because of fire. It's just a natural process of erosion. I see. Yeah. Yes, erosion and then pushing the soil out through mm -hmm. the channel and then creates this pattern and then attracts the people to develop. I, I guess, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Huh, I never thought that way. So that was kind of a interesting findings. With, while, we're, while we're on this, what is the recurrence frequency of these fans? Like how frequently do these uh, events happen in the same place? So generally these happen fairly slowly over time. Um, a lot of these alluvial fans you know, the, the streams that are associated with it, they don't flow year round. They only flow maybe when there's a big storm or they just intermittently, they only flow like part of the year. And so it's a really slow process. Um, it's, it's when you have a disturbance like fire and you have that potential for debris flow, that's when you get a huge slug of material coming down. Um, so I, you know, I'm not a geologist, per se, so I can't tell you in terms of like how many years it takes to develop one of these, but it's it's quite a bit of time. It's not something that happens overnight, I guess is what I'm saying. Anybody wants uh, to ask actually, more? I have a question, okay. uh, which may okay. be unrelated and uh, in this lecture, we talk about the welfare issue, and to uh, I think you just use some muscle to manage this load and uh, coincidentally solve welfare issue as well. So uh, it's like a related element, which is water and fair, and uh, maybe uh, it is like the contradict element to each other. So. But uh, you just make it really reasonable that the fire causes so damage lead to the erosion, which caused the flood, flood in, in the same area. So um, you make the unrelated elements together to generate the inspiring strategy, like using the tube or canal, channel to arrange the flood or stream, and finally the water accumulate to uh, build the basin to stop the fire again. So uh, my question is that how you combine those two fields together because it is totally uh, unrelated to each other. And I just think it is really hard to link one to another. So how do you just generate these ideas? Okay, I, I think I, could, I, I couldn't capture all of your question. I, I know you were asking about two different processes. Is that, so fire and what was the other one? Uh, the flood. The, the flood? Yeah. Um, so you're asking like, how are these two things related to each other? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, 
So what I was trying to illustrate, um, so with the, so we have this hydrologic cycle. Um, so the water evaporates, it rains and it flows back into the ocean or large streams. And then when you have a fire that burns over um, for like instance, in this uh, right photo, um, a lot of your trees, they're, you know, the trees are dead. So it's not, it's not taking, it's not sucking up water. Um, and then the other process is this hydrophobicity. So water is not getting soaked into the ground. Um, it's just washing off. And so when you have the combination of those two things, um, you have more water running off of your hill slopes. And so that's what causes the floods. Does that, does that kind of answer your question? Yes, kind of, because uh, I think when we just try to focus on fire, it's really uh, um, not normal for us to think about the flood. So uh, how do you just, when you try to solve the problem of fire and then you see uh, Masao to manage the flood in order to stop the fire? Yeah, I, I so need... go, Sorry, ahead. go ahead. Sorry, go for it. No, no, no. No, I just wanted to say that the fire is not just about the burning. That includes mm -hmm. uh, precondition and a postcondition. So we are talking about the much larger phenomena that include this post fire post fire a flood as well. So it's a part of the, actually the large sort of phenomena of fire. I mean, that's how I, I would think. Yeah, and I know you- Go ahead, sorry. Oh, I was just, I was just gonna add that, um, I, I think you guys had a uh, lecture from, from uh, Brandon Collins earlier, and he talked about like management of forests. And so this all ties back to it because a lot of the major wildfires do happen on, um, you know, on these forested landscapes and with, with the lack of, you know, keeping up with clean, you know, making sure that we don't have these hot fires. Well, we do have these big hot fires because we've been so good at fire suppression for over a hundred years. Um, so we've kind of created this condition um, for ourselves and, and, you know, not just the big fires, but this flooding um, to some extent as well. Um, uh, so hopefully that kind of captures what your question, what you had questions about. Okay, thank you. Actually, I have a also strange questions. You said actually the fire burns the roots of the trees, right? Does it affect also the nature of the soil underneath or it changes the way that the, actually the, the behavior of the land or I, I'm it, just curious. It does, you know, I, I don't know if there's been a whole lot of research done um, on, you know, the roots burning and affecting soils because, I mean, some of these trees root systems, they're, I mean, they go down like. Yeah, you know, because it's, it's almost the same as a tree above, right? Yeah, yeah. So no, you're you're actually, you're, you, that's a really good question. And, and I, I'm not sure, but I'm sure it does to some extent. Um, I will add that, you know, so soils, it, it's, it's, it's layered. So your top layer, you have your organic matter um, that's, that's, you know, where everything thrives. And as further down you go, I think there's, you know, there's less nutrients. So, um, and it's more um, just like mineral, mineral soils. Um, so there could be, so, so that's a really good question. I, unfortunately, I, I don't know how to answer that, but um, it's, okay. it's, worth it's, research, okay. it's worth researching. Uh, so I kind of have more of a kind of question as to finding out a little bit more about the, the fire whirls or tornadoes that you were speaking about at the beginning. Um, I just had like a quick Google to find out if this is becoming a more frequent uh, phenomenon or if it's because of the scale of the fires that are happening, whether we are having fires that have now the capability of producing more of these fire tornadoes. Is that something that we're seeing happening more often? Like I, I went on Wikipedia 
and found that it said for the first time in history, the US National uh, Weather Service issued a tornado warning for the wildfire, like as an additional step to the wildfire being already causing the damage that it does um, because it has the capabilities of actually producing this fire tornado, which in itself sounds incredibly terrifying. <laughs> that there can be a fire tornado as well as just the wildfire that's going out of control. Yeah, and and, and um, I think it, it's definitely, I feel like within the last like four years, we've, we've heard more of these fire tornadoes. And I think it's just because it's, these fires are just, they're just hotter, they're bigger, and they're burning, um, they're, they're burning more at nighttime. Um, usually um, in the past, you know, the fire like slows down at night because it's it's cool it's supposed to be cooler and you know you get more moisture in the air but that's not happening now and so what a lot of fire researchers will say is that these fires are essentially creating their own weather um, so you know you have a fire front it's actually heating everything in front of it so causing it to dry out um, and then you know with just and I'm not a meteorologist, but with the different air pressures, um, I think it's just it's just making it easier for these fire fire tornadoes to develop. Um, and you're absolutely right. I I, I would imagine that it would be terrifying seeing one in person. Thanks a lot. Hello. Hi. Um, I had a couple of questions. Um, first one was about so when you spoke about how the roots are still burning after a wildfire um, I was curious to know does that make it possible for the vegetation or the trees to be spreading fire as well you know, in the underground system because um, or is that just because after a fire there is not enough circulation of air that goes in and hence the heat gets trapped inside which can then cause for the fires. I I couldn't quite track your whole question. I think you asked about post fire and something about vegetation. Yes, since the root uh, also gets burned, and that that would is that a medium for the fire to spread then? Um, it can be the next year. So you're you're talking you you were asking about the roots. Yes. Yeah. So what happens is, and this doesn't. I mean. And so what happens is the roots will get burned. Um, it sits underground over the winter time. And then the following year when it gets hot again, like in the summer, um, it'll, it'll actually kind of push itself back up. Um, it, it's not very common that it actually, it'll cause another big fire, but it just, it smolders um, until, you know, either it just gets put out by itself or someone goes and, puts water on it um, to, to put it out. Uh, so my question was, is it because so generally there is, there, are, um, there is wildlife or certain rodents or something that would circulate, say the air that goes in the soil. So do you think is it because of a wildfire the entire, um, say the wildlife is kind of eradicated from that patch of land so the heat is just trapped inside for the winter for it to come out the next summer um so wildlife is a good question um so a lot of times luckily they're mobile so animals that can go can, that can run they will um away from a fire um and we do see usually slowly about a year or two after they will come back once the vegetation reestablishes itself. Um, so, but I, I'm not a wildlife biologist, so I don't know exactly what those populations look like, but just from, you know, my personal, um, you know, observations, I, I have seen um, like the deer, they'll usually come back actually pretty good the year after because they like, um, they like the, the new, shrubs and the trees that come back um so it's it's a i mean it's a process that you know they're somewhat adapted to um wildfires same thing with fish um 
they they are supposed to be you know adapted to wildfires but you know maybe not huge fires that we're seeing now right so hopefully hopefully that answers your question um, uh, I have another are, question. Oh, oh, oh good. good. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so generally, like in like revo streams, the aluminum fans are at like when they join the oceans and they kind of deposit the silt there. And those areas become like probably like mangroves or some kind of other ecosystem thrives on that silt deposition. Um, so is there a cycle when you have these aluminum fans getting formed in mountains. Was there a natural cycle or a process that existed, say, before developers thought of building a city or a district there? Is there a natural process that used to happen that got disturbed because of our intervention? I'm sorry, you were really broken up um, on in that last question um something about processes i heard the ocean if anyone can um if anyone heard her uh, i'll type it in maybe okay um while while uh, palabi is uh, typing it um uh, hydro uh, I, I have a question to fill the time if you will um i think hydrophobicity is definitely uh, a new word for us. Uh, it's super, super interesting. And um, uh, so, it, uh, you know, it, it, I guess there are a lot of questions that are coming up because of that. Um, like, is there any kind of metric for it? Um, I mean, it, this is back to real estate, but is there any metric for it in terms of, of um, land maps? Because I mean, what, what we're finding in the Santa Monica Mountains is a, um, a, a, a kind of um, landscape of irrational real estate sales. Um, so basically we found um, a correlation between frequency of area burned with increase in real estate prices and increase in number of um, properties sold and properties redeveloped. Um, which should not be happening, obviously. Um, but like, you know, and, and so we want to illustrate just how, um, uh, um, you know, crazy this is going to be if this continues. And maybe one way for us to help describe that is hydrophobicity. Like, are there any ways where this could be mapped or document documented or is data being collected and is that are there data sets that are shareable that can that, that we ha can have access to yeah so in terms of like fire induced hydrophobicity that's kind of like a case to case basis um but so there's so soils isn't just soil there's there's like many many different types of soils what their parent geology is. So soils are derived from, you know, from a mixture of organic material and, and um, geology, so rocks essentially. Um, so there are, so each type of soil will have different types of like, different levels of hydrophobicity, if you will, naturally. Um, probably the best resource I can think of is something called Web Soil Survey. Um, so the, the entire United States is mapped, um, has its soils mapped. Um, some of it is, is, you know, a lot more detailed than others, but um, if you go, and, and I can share this resource with you um, off offline if, if you're still interested, um, but this web soil survey has a lot of really good information on buildability, on, you know, is its erosion factor, and it, it um, you know, if you, if you talk to the right person, they can tell you based off what they see from the survey, how hydrophobic it is. Mm -hmm. Um, so that is, there is, there is information out there. Great. Great. Thank you so much, Hilda. Hilda, but this, uh, hydrophobicity is, uh, sort of, uh, 
how say natural nature of the soil and then it's accelerated because of the fire because also it determined by the different other facts such as vegetations for instance if there is a vegetation it helps to hold the water more right so it's a it's a complex measure to actually understand how much water will be kind of uh, absorbed by the uh, land. Yeah, it is super complex and um, definitely depending on your, your vegetation types, um, your soils may be more hydrophobic or less hydrophobic. And, um, huh. you know, depending on your soil type you and your vegetation type, I'm sorry, um, that can, you know, tell, tell you a little bit about how, how dry and how much water soils can actually hold because it's, you know, some soils will, will hold a lot more water than others. So it leads me to, it leads me to the question that I wanted to ask. Sorry, Jeffrey, I, I, it's just, uh, is there any also map showing the kind of a moisture level or I know it changes, but the, some sort of a way to measure you know, the, the, I don't know even, the like amount of the water that the, each land is holding. Yeah, I, I that web, know. yeah, so the web soil survey um, does have some has those. on that. I see. And then also the question is when there's a fire comes, the behavior of the fire might be different depending on if that land is, has more moisture or not, you think? I it, guess. It, it can, but I feel like with these larger fires that we're seeing now, that doesn't even I matter. Um, doesn't care. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So definitely that uh, website is somewhere that we should just check. That would be a really good starting point. Yeah. I see. Okay, and I see um, Halabi's question here. Um, she wanted to know if there are any natural ecosystems or a water body um, that these alluvial fans used to originally be before the process was disturbed by development. Um, so these alluvial fans are, they're everywhere. Um, they're more so in like dry deserty locations. Um, so there's, there's still, I mean, some of them are really big, big enough where you can build a whole subdivision in, and some of them are, are a lot smaller, but, um, you still can find them naturally, um, out, out in, in the landscape today. It, it hopefully does that kind of answer your question. Yeah, thank you. I have a, uh, I, I was really struck by the two videos that you showed, the, um, particularly the one where the river of debris was moving at a really fast pace, but it was also a, an enormous quantity of water, like a, a flash flood situation. And then the other one was the, the drone shot to show just how far the earth had traveled. Um, I mean, I think it's accurate to, to say that these events seem to be in a level of like the sublime. I like, uh, can't even understand how big they are and where, how far they actually go. Uh, I guess, I don't know, if that, that's not really the question. I guess maybe a question that relates to that though is um, once these events happen, what is the, the water surface condition and the ground condition um, in the same areas like the following years? Is it once a debris flow happens, does the ground start to become a little bit more absorbent or do, you, do we continuously see more and more debris flows over a long period of time until let's say, uh, you know, the trees take root and, and fortify the, the earth, let's say? I guess another, another question that, that's tied to that, though, is uh, are there, um, to, to make it less sublime, more kind of to something we can understand, are there, um, let's say, interventions that happen uh, 
either actively or potentially could happen, like, you know, retaining walls, but I don't think retaining walls is a really good, good solution, but are there like interventions that happen within some of these zones to, um, let's say, mitigate further slides or um, maybe begin the process of refortifying the earth through planting trees or other acts? Yeah. Um, so for your first question about um, timing and, and whether these debris slides continue to happen, um, that's really um, a matter of whether vegetation establishes back on the landscape. Um, and generally, you know, in California, I would say maybe like three to five years usually is enough for enough time that's passed for vegetation to reestablish. Um, and, you know, like with weather, that's something that sometimes is, a lot of times is unpredictable to, to how, you know, how much and how intense, especially like a lot of these debris events, um, they're a, res a result of thunderstorms. So literally like a cell of water hitting, um, you know, one area really, really intensely for a, a short amount of time. Um, so those are a lot harder to predict. Um, but generally, you won't see, you know, it, as long as vegetation reestablished, you won't see this like debris happening over and over again, um, unless, unless, you know, there's just no way for the plants to recover. Um, and then your second question about intervention. Um, the Forest Service had, tr has tried, uh, and we still do, try to do a lot of these. Um, so when I talked about, um, was it there? So land treatments, they've experimented a lot with um, in the 90s and early 2000s, um, but it's, it's really expensive um, to do these land treatments. And, you know, and, and we are talking about a debris flow, you know, putting mulch and straw and hay on, a ground, on the landscape, that's probably not gonna do much. Um, they have put in, oh, I forget which town it is. Um, I don't think, I don't think it's Pasadena. It's one of those towns near Pasadena where they put in a bunch of K rails, um, in like in the street to prevent, you know, basically to de deflect water and debris, um, from going into people's houses, um, after I think it was the station fire. Um, and I think some of those K rails are still out there. So. Um, that's, uh, that's something that, you know, that's kind of like the, like, oh, we need to do something to try to do something. And, um, that's usually what ends up happening. Um, the best way is just to get out of the way and let, and let nature do its thing. Okay. Uh, I guess, uh, Time is running out, but is there any other question that you'd like to ask? Last question, maybe? Okay, so Hilder, is that okay if we come up with more questions? Can we email you or something? I know you're busy, oh, but uh, that would yeah. be fantastic. I'm yeah. sure, you know, uh, later on, as we move forward with the project, there might be or there will be many questions coming up related to the water in the land. So thank you though. Uh, everybody please give round of applause to today's speaker. And- uh, Thank you, Hilda. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.